Um, thinking about 13 or so years ago, a dozen years ago, we'll say ASP is utility computing. If you remember back then, you will remember that they failed. ASPs failed. Utility computing went nowhere. But things did change. And what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how they changed and how they've morphed into this brave new world called the Internet of Things. And talk about how real it is, so build on some of the comments that were made this morning by Shlomo, uh, and the demo, which was the best demo I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about what it means in terms of software, what it means in terms of licensing, of course, but most importantly, talk about what it means in terms of business ideas. And you know, we'll use some of the same terms you've heard this morning about transforming your business and the rest. But I hope I'll have some uh, very tangible examples about you know, what it means and how you might be able to take advantage of some of these ideas. Okay? So let's, while we're talking about ASPs and utility computing, let's go through a brief history of computing. It started way back when, right, uh, with the, the idea of computing being a highly centralized utility that only a privileged few could take advantage of. Now, the irony here is when we think about these data centers, in fact, the idea of shared services were born in data centers that were owned by a specific industry. Anybody remember the industry that originated the first wave of shared computing services? Anybody? Aerospace. Up oh, some of it. Thank you. Air, airlines, aerospace. Terrific. And that business actually grew and continues to exist in one form or another today. Uh, but it was the idea of excess capacity being utilized to support third parties. And in fact, that same idea uh, took shape or took hold uh, in the 80s when I first joined the telecommunications industry. Uh, there were a number of companies who decided they were going to be their own bell as a result of the divestiture of the bell um, system. Uh, they were going to fill that void and buy excess capacity, and lo and behold, they were going to sell excess um, services. Uh, that idea of networking also transformed the computing industry. And a company in my backyard in Boston uh, called Digital Equipment Corporation helped to pioneer the idea of distributed computing. Uh, and even with that idea, the idea of computing still remained within the organization. It may have spread out to the branch offices, uh, but it was still an internal resource. We fast forward to the past decade, and of course we know that what's happened is the mobile devices that we all take advantage of, and we even raffle off in, in events like today, um, has changed not only where computing happens, but how software is consumed and distributed, right? So we move from BYOD to BYOA. Then the first thing that happens when someone gets their new you know, um, mobile device is they find apps, right? Uh, and the consumerization effect of that process has been enormous. How many of us would have talked about our latest apps over the dining room table a couple of years ago? Uh, but now we're trading apps all day long, right? Now, there's more to this than just the fact that the computing power has moved out into the, the world in a way that was not conceived maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's now that this example of the way in which computing power can be distributed is being advanced into an even wider population of things and objects and devices and services. So the idea that everything around us can be connected is becoming more and more real. And what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking about what makes that possible and what is made possible by that, in fact, happening. And what's interesting to note is that surrounding this is an um, explosion, if you will, of new technologies, 
and old technologies that are advancing quite rapidly. And um, one of the things that you know, I've been looking at for a long time is the interconnectedness of technologies and software that creates an ecosystem of relationships. And in fact, in this marketplace, as it expands, there are going to be even more relationships that need to take place in order to make it work. And all of those relationships are going to be bounded together, if you will, by software. It's going to be the software that represents the glue in all of this. It requires connectivity, but it's the software that, in, in fact, enables the connections between those, um, those devices and objects and services that we're looking at. So what has allowed this to happen is a confluence of forces that starts with a rapid advancement in nanotechnologies, in the sensors that could be attached to anything. You put them on the bottle cap of this bottle here. You can put them on the bottom of your chair. You can put it onto anything. And with the new connectivity that we have to these sensors, we can, of course, create new networks, right? And with those new networks, we have the opportunity to capture a lot of data. The ideas that were talked about earlier today. Because it's the data that's the most important thing. It's not having the, the, the sensors out wherever you might want them. It's not having the network that connects them. It's about the data that's collected from those end objects, devices, and things. And if we have the opportunity to capture that data and have the opportunity to, in fact, analyze that data so we understand what that data means, we now have an opportunity to do greater things with that data that can influence or at least respond to changing demand in the marketplace. And in fact, the consumerization effect, which has allowed almost all of us to become comfortable with these ideas of being better connected, is opening up new business opportunities, which are represented by this idea of the Internet of Things. That's not a new idea. In the, in the area that I'm from, in Boston, it's been a um, breeding ground for what's been referred to as M to M technologies for a long time. But it's this, this idea that it can be expanded into new markets that's made it even more popular. Okay? So these are the building blocks that's made this possible. Let's talk about why the cloud is a key component in enabling this all to happen. And it starts with the fact that the cloud gives us this ubiquitous connectivity. And it goes from there to looking at how the cloud has allowed us to, in fact, capture and store data more economically. And along the way, it's given us computing power that allows us to better understand the data. It's giving us the analytic engine that allows us not only to understand the data, but to share that data across the organization, across an ecosystem, across the great divide between customers and their vendors. And none of this, again, would be possible if it weren't for the economics of the cloud. We wouldn't be talking about big data a few years ago if it weren't for the cloud, and we're not, we wouldn't be talking about the Internet of Things if it weren't for the cloud. And where did the most important innovation of the cloud come from? Anybody want to fathom a guess? It's a little company that had excess capacity who decided, you know, maybe someone would be interested in this capacity. And they said, well, throw it out there and we'll see what happens. It was about 10 years ago they did it. And the innovation wasn't so much that they had the spare capacity and they made it available. The innovation was they said you can have it whenever you like it, for as long as you like it. Now, anybody who's been paying attention to the evolution of the cloud marketplace would probably want to believe that a little software company up the street called Salesforce.com really was the innovator when it came to these kinds of services. But if you know anything about Salesforce.com, you know that they are really not a pay-as-you-go company. 
In most cases, unless you really, really have a tremendous amount of buying power, you pay for what you want a year in advance, and you pay for it, whether you like it or not, a year later. Now, I love Salesforce.com. Don't get me wrong. I love Salesforce.com. I wouldn't be in business if they didn't prove that SaaS could be successful. But even Mark Benioff, in his book about going to the cloud, admits that if they tried to stick with the original model, which is pay as you go on a monthly basis, they would have been out of business a long time ago. Now, in today's world, because of the, the, the cloud-based billing and licensing capabilities that we now have at our disposal, Salesforce might have chosen to take a different route and emulate what Amazon is doing. But knowing Mark Benioff, he probably wouldn't have done it that way. He would prefer to have the money up front. It's about cash flow, right? But the point is that this on and off capability transformed the way people thought about things. And it's changed the way software is thought of as well. We think about having an app, we want it immediately. And if we don't like it, we want to turn it off immediately. And that's putting greater pressure on the software industry. But it's also opening up new opportunities as well. Now, you know, I've been focused on the cloud for a long time. And I like to tell a story about um, how my mom, who's now 94, going to be 95 in about a month and a half, uh, is an avid reader of the New Yorker magazine, and for years she had no idea what I did. Nobody in my family knows what the hell I do. My wife doesn't care as long as the checks keep on coming home, right? Uh, so my mom calls me up one day, and she says, Jeff, you're on the cover of the New Yorker magazine. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so sure enough, this cover, which I believe was from 2012, really made my mother's day. Um, but what's also interesting is you, know, you think about how popular our neighbors here at Apple have made the cloud through iCloud. And uh, you know, getting back to what Ray was talking about, digital natives don't get it. You know, I've worked with a number of um, college-age kids for the conferences I, I, I run around cloud computing. And they'll ask me, you know, when we have a kind of an off moment, they'll say, um, so Mr. Kaplan, You've got this event happening about the cloud. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? So you know, this kind of thing is you know, transformative. But on the other hand, it's, it's business as usual for that digital native audience. Now, as a result, they expect the kind of connectivity we have here all around them. They want to know where they are on their GPS system, no matter where they are. They want to know where they can go, no matter where they happen to be. Uh, and that's the kind of expectation that's driving a lot of organizations to say, OK, if we're going to make that happen, we have to do things differently. And of course, the old on-premises world wasn't able to support that and still isn't. And that's why we see a rush to the cloud to provide the connectivity, the storage capability, um, and the information sharing, as well as the analytic capability that we're seeing nowadays. And you know, one of the most, mild, most um, influential uh, writings of the past couple of years came from Mark Andreessen, where he talked about how software is eating everything. And even today, there are plenty of examples about how this is becoming more and more of a truism. Um, one of the examples, which actually happened a while back, is the example of Avis. When they admitted in their press release that they were buying Zipcar not only because of its agility and the way in which it's able to deploy and package and price their rental cars, but they stated in the press release it was about the software that enabled them to do just that. It was a software acquisition play that they were making to change the way in which their business works. And of course, you heard uh, Ray. Um, very enthusiastically talk about the sharing economy, and that's the ultimate extension of that same idea. What we're also seeing, though, is that same capability permeating almost every industry. Some of them, you know, we can see every day around the connected car, and we're going to talk a little bit about ways you may not be aware of that that's taking hold. You know about uh, what Google did when they bought Nest, 
they brought greater attention to the idea of the connected home. Uh, and you know what Google is doing in terms of wearables, and I was at Salesforce's uh, Dreamforce event last week where Will I Am came out with his new uh, watch, and he's a very bright guy. He knows that it's not just about the consumer opportunity, but there's a tremendous commercial opportunity there as well. And it just so happens, just to play that point out a, a little bit further, I was at an executive briefing that morning that was held by a, a prominent SaaS company, Financial Force, and their entire executive staff are wearing connected uh, watches. And they're not wearing it because they want to be you know, hip. They're not a hip, very hip group. I love them, but they're not hip. They're wearing it because you can now access financial data about your company from your watch. So if you, if you don't uh, make your numbers, on, you, know, you know on your watch where you stand. Okay? And then the, the myth that the healthcare is, uh, industry is going to be the slowest adopter of these new technologies is just that. It's a myth. Uh, the healthcare providers are hungry for this. The only thing holding it back is, of course, policies and politics. But the fact of the matter is, in Boston, where we've got a tremendous amount of innovation going on in this area, we're seeing a lot of things happening here. And it extends beyond just these uh, recognizable, if you, if you will, areas. But let's dive into one of them and talk about um, what these mean. In fact, um, I'm going to set this up with a picture that, uh, where's Mike? Mike? Michael here? Where's my, my friend Michael Welch? Michael, you'll appreciate this picture. Um, so Michael and I both have uh, cycling in common. He's given it up because he's gotten too old. I'm getting younger every day, so I'm still doing it. Um, and a lot of people think, because all guys with mustaches look alike, that that's me on that bike. Now, first of all, I don't know what kind of a bike that is. I've never ridden a bike that quite looks like that. But anyways, uh, I've also never done what that guy is doing. And that is, I've never worn a suit on my bike. Now, I also would never do what he's doing, because there, if I open this up, you would guess that there might be a bus coming or a truck coming that's going to whack that guy because he's looking down rather than looking up. He doesn't have a helmet. But in fact, what I'm, I'm trying to point out here is that the connectivity that we now have at our disposal does two things. It's a two-way street, of course. I'm able, no matter where I am, on my bike or elsewhere, to gather information about you know, a lot of things that I need to know as a consumer and as a customer, but just as importantly, the vendors who are serving me are gathering information about who I am, what I want, what I prefer, how my needs might change, and therefore why they may be at risk, and ultimately how they can retain me and make me happy. Okay? Now, there is a, um, an app for that, <laughs> like there is everything else, and Michael knows of this app very well. It's an app called Strava. And Strava is w one of many apps that's geared towards tracking my behavior, supposedly so I can feel better about myself if I ride faster today than I rode yesterday and ride even faster tomorrow. But the real intent is so that the folks who subscribe to Strava on the other side of the screen have a better idea about how to best serve me. Okay? So, if we're looking at this from a consumer point of view, it seems pretty obvious. But let's talk about the conversion of consumer to commercial opportunities here. We'll take the example of the car. We all know about the service OnStar. And we know what its purpose is to better serve that, um, that driver who may need help finding some local attraction, we'll say, but more importantly, may need help if something goes wrong. Well, there's a corollary that actually exists, uh, which I was made aware of at a recent MIT CIO forum, and that's Daimler Chrysler. Or Daimler, I should say, Daimler Benz now. They've split off. Uh, but most importantly, it's the Daimler Trucking Division, which happens to be based up in Portland. And both of these uh, vendors, if you will, IoT vendors, are doing exactly the same thing. You have one on the consumer side, one on the commercial side, and what they're doing is this. First of all, they're providing a set of reactive services so that if something goes wrong with your car or something goes wrong with their truck, 
um, they can respond more quickly, okay? Because they've been notified of that, of that, um, that event, we'll call it. Number two, they can track the movement of the car or the truck, and they can gauge when something might go wrong and proactively notify the driver or the owner. And let's look at the Daimler example. It could be a fleet operator and say, you know what, it's time to change the tires or change the brakes so that you don't have problems and don't suffer downtime. Then they can also capture that data and inform the driver and the fleet owner of ways in which they can operate more efficiently. So instead of taking the long way around to get from point A to point B, maybe they can give them a route that will take them the shorter uh, path to that destination. And ultimately, maybe they can use that data for other purposes. Now I'm going to give you an example of a company who's doing just that. But if you think about it, it's all about the data. But the data wouldn't be possible without the connectivity. The connectivity wouldn't make a difference unless we could capture that data more cost effectively. All right? All of which being powered by software. And it makes your head spin a little bit thinking about, okay, how are you going to package and price that software to align with the value that's being delivered here. So let's talk about other examples. Here's one I saw recently. There is a mat you can buy if you like to do yoga, which will in fact track your movements by where you put your hands and your knees and the pressure you place there, and can actually map that out in such a way as to give you help in terms of making your yoga experience more effective. This is something that's out in the marketplace today. And of course, like Strava, ultimately they're going to be able to tell you how you compare and contrast with other yoga people, right? Well, you know that someone's going to put a mat like that into your favorite grocery store and start tracking the movements of the people around that grocery store. Or maybe they'll put it into the local warehouse and start tracking the movements around the warehouse. Or other kinds of applications of that same kind of technology. Again, we now have the sensors that are cost effective. We have the connectivity that's cost effective. We have the data uh, engine, the analytic engine that's cost effective. And we have the, the inclination of a data-driven society and business decision makers that run the gamut from end users to executives who want this data. We want this data. We want this insight. We want to know how we can improve ourselves or improve our performance in our jobs. So let's look at another example. I mentioned Nest. Nest comes along and makes us all aware of the possibilities of better managing the costs of our homes. And lo and behold, there's a little company called GE who's got a very big idea about doing the very same thing in almost every industrial environment you can imagine. And that's why they are now leading the charge of something that's called the industrial internet to provide a fortified version of the kinds of resources that we are taking for granted, granted today in the cloud to better support higher level of usage across a variety of commercial markets. Not only for their own purposes, but for others as well, okay? So here's an interesting story that brings all of this home in a very mundane marketplace. This company called Engage is based in, in a little town south of Boston. And it's a 100-year-old family business. It's in the metering business. Now, when they first started, they were putting mechanical meters on anything they could find. And they started to hone in on safety devices, they called them, like fire extinguishers. And they moved over the past 10, 15 years from mechanical devices on top of each and every one of those fire extinguishers to digital devices. The idea being that with the advent of new technologies, and most importantly, software, 
they can make those meters more accurate, uh, more responsive, and more cost effective. However, they weren't satisfied with just going digital and making this a software enabled fire extinguisher. They've now made it, it, made it rather, a connected fire extinguisher. Now, someone might react by saying, why the heck do we need a connected fire extinguisher? It's kind of like, you know, why do we need a connected um, appliance? Or even as Mark Benioff tried to prove to us, why do we need a connected toothbrush? It's all about the data. Now, first of all, again, think about the, the, the various kinds of benefits I mentioned with OnStar, with Daimler trucking. It's about being able to react quicker, being able to anticipate, being able to harvest data to better serve your current customers, but more importantly, think about the new opportunities. Let me walk you through some of these. They can improve performance by, first of all, ensuring that that fire extinguisher can work when it's needed, right? And they can do that in such a way that they can reduce the cost by, the, by knowing what this, the state is of that fire extinguisher, okay? They can also improve satisfaction, of course, because if there's a fire in this building and the fire extinguisher works, you're going to be a whole lot happier than if it doesn't work, right? So then you say to yourself, okay, that's fine. Now they're profitable. Now everybody's happy. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that data has been collected by that company, and that company is now selling that data to insurance companies. And now, the insurance company knows whether or not they need to raise or whether they should offer a discount for the insurance rates for this hotel and others who are using that fire extinguisher. A whole new business, whole new revenue opportunities, whole new competitive advantage for this company, okay? It's happening in ag tech with companies now keeping an eye on moisture levels and nutrient levels in the soil, as well as inside the stomachs, inside the stomachs of cattle. They're putting sensors in the stomachs to make sure they're getting the right nutrition. So, how do you stratify, how do you segment this marketplace? You think about, first of all, the reactive opportunities, the proactive opportunities, the informa informational opportunities, and the transformational opportunities. And you think about, first of all, being able to monitor, secondly, being able to meter, third, being able to report on the information that you're gathering, but most importantly, being able to measure how it matches the performance of others. We all know about the explosion of data. We all know how it's coming from all over. But what we're now seeing is new ways to be able to target our products and our services using software to help us navigate all of this. So it, it means being able to capture information from every keystroke, compile that information, and then analyze that data across the population. And if you do it right, by the way, you also gain a competitive advantage because there's a value add there and you create a club, an exclusive club for those users who feel like they're gaining an advantage because they get greater information and more importantly, better insights. So again, redefine your business from just being a software business to not only being a business services business, but also an information services business. Just like Engage. And I've got a good friend from the Boston area who's been talking about data and the power of data forever, and he can't get his smile off his face because he's so happy nowadays. This guy, Tom Davenport, is a wonderful guy, talks about data analysis all the time, and he talks about how we're all in the data business. Now, of course, there's security issues and privacy issues, and there are huge issues, and there are a lot of concerns about them, but they're not going to slow down this movement. Uh, it's going to grow, and it's going to grow fast. And what we're going to see is as people begin to move down this path, they're going to see 
a different kind of value pro proposition. The four areas I talked about, about reducing costs and reducing time and improving services and being able to become more efficient and being able to open up new opportunities because you're improving the quality of your services and doing all that with the hopes of being able to improve customer satisfaction, but ultimately to gain a competitive advantage. Now, along the way, we all have to figure out how we're going to take these new capabilities to market through different kinds of mechanisms, different kinds of uh, marketplaces, how we're going to measure their value, how we're going to transact across different kinds of uh, payment processes, and even how we're going to track that software. And that's why you're all here. But ultimately, it's all about better understanding the nature of your customers' requirements and the opportunity to open up new business relationships with them. So that means that you not only have to think about this in terms of your direct relationship, but because of the expanse of services and products that are out there, think about new channels of marketing and how you're going to track. That's interesting, the way that's change there. Anyways, you get the idea. It's very impressionistic. It was something, who said there's a Van Gogh or someone? It wasn't that way when I first put it on there. Anyways, so it's not only about, by the way, opening up new opportunities, but also making sure you're not missing the opportunity to gather the revenue from the sources you've already identified. You know, we, we all know about the fact that there's a lot of leakage in these kinds of services. And those still need to be better managed. If you do it right, of course, you've got an opportunity to increase satisfaction and profitability. If you do it wrong, you have an opportunity to be out of business. How does that sound? Uh, but the key to all of this is to think differently about how this movement to this brave new world of the Internet of Things is changing the way in which software is being deployed and embedded into this new set of um, dynamics. So with that, I'm going to leave you, and I'm going to let you introduce our next speaker. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you feel, but I, I must say always when uh, I hear these sessions at Licensing Live from the industry experts after three of these sessions, there's quite a lot of information you have to digest, yeah? Uh, probably all of us will go away and uh, need a week or two yeah, to filter out what, which of these messages we can translate into actions in our business uh, tomorrow, yeah? Um, now, 